Now, this morning, just for a few moments, uh, I just want to spend a, f uh, a minute or two, a few minutes, and I've decided to call this subject this morning, The Beautiful Gate, a Model of Discipleship. The Beautiful Gate, a Model of Discipleship. Let us pray. Our Father, we invite you to be with us and speak to us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Acts, the third chapter. We're going to Acts, the third chapter, and I want to read verses 1 to 6 is as we introduce the subject. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Now, if you found it, it says uh, in verse 1, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain, lame, uh, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Verse 6, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Now, in order to, to put this, this uh, scripture in its correct context or passage, we need to go back into what the setting of this was. This, of course, is in the setting of Acts chapter 2. Now, Jesus, when he died, had left uh, the disciples a uh, command and a promise. He said to them, don't go anywhere until you receive power from on high. And uh, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says, when that day was fully arrived or fully came, they were all gathered together in one place, and then something special happened. This was a usual Pentecost. It was a day that many people came together to celebrate the, the first fruits, the, the time of, of, of awakening, the time of, of revival. And the Bible says there were people from every country gathered in that place on the day of Pentecost. But on that special day, something happened that was different. The Bible says there was a special anointing, a special blessing, the promise that God had said would come. Jesus had promised the disciple came upon the disciples on that fateful day. And they were anointed with power. Cloven tongues of fire came upon them. The room began to shake, and there was a great noise. And the scripture says that they began to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And as they went outside and ministered to the large group of people that had gathered from the diaspora, Jews from every part of the world collecting together on the celebration day, the people listening to them thought they were drunk. The Bible says they thought that they were inebriated. And it was Peter, that great transformed disciple, who said to them, no, we are not drunk, we are not inebriated, we are not drink excess alcohol, as some of you count it, but this is that which was promised by the Holy Ghost in the promise of Joel. In the latter day I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see dreams, and your, your old men shall see dreams, your young men shall see vision. And he says, this is that which was promised. And the Holy Ghost came upon them with great power. And the Bible says, and as they spoke to the people, men's hearts were convicted. And the scripture says that they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and they were saved. And many were joined to the church. The Bible says, as many as believed, 3,000 people in one day were baptized and joined the church. And the Holy Ghost's power was falling in a marvelous and mighty way. And people were joining into the fellowship of the believers. That's Acts chapter 2. And that is the setting for which we go now to Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, if you go to verse 1, the Bible says they were praising God in verse 47. And having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. 
So in Acts chapter 3 now, the Bible tells us that Peter and John are going to the temple. Now I want us to recognize something here. The Bible says that they were going to the temple at the hour of prayer, being about the ninth hour. Now the Jewish in the Jewish system or the Jewish economy, they would go to the temple to pray three times every day. They would go at the sixth hour, which would be, they would go at the third hour, which was approximately nine o'clock hour time. They would go at the sixth hour, which would be approximately midday, and they would go again at the ninth hour, which would be approximately three o'clock. It was during the first and the third and last hours they would have the evening sacrifice, where they would offer the sacrifices for the sins of the people, where a priest would come and they would kill, they would slay the priest, the, the priest would slay the lamb, and the lamb would be, uh, the blood of the lamb would be sprinkled on, uh, on the, the instruments of the place, the holy place. The Bible tells us that that represented the lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. It's amazing and interesting to know that it was approximately at the ninth hour that Jesus died. The Bible says it was at the ninth hour as he was lying uh, uh, there, laying there on the cross that he gave up the ghost. And the Bible says that was the Lamb of God that was slain for the foundation of the world. Well, Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. And I want to say, first of all, we need to recognize when we're looking at discipleship, the first element of discipleship is prayer. It is prayer. Now, I want you to notice that, G, that Peter and John didn't go to disciples to hear about prayer. You see, we have a lot of people who tell us about prayer rather than praying. There's lots of people who give us a lot of information about prayer, but there are very few people who are praying. But the Bible tells us that when Peter and John went into the temple, they went into the temple to pray. They went into the temple to communicate with God. They went into the temple to reach out to God in prayer, being about the ninth hour. And so the first thing I've learned and gathered from Acts chapter 3 is if we are going to be effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, we must not learn about prayer. We must learn to pray. We must learn to communicate with God. We must talk to God about uh, us, talk to God about our situation, but be in communication with God. You know, the Bible says that our lifestyle should be that of God. I like the King James Version. The Bible says our conversation shall be in heaven. And I somehow like that word because sometimes we talk about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. We talk about having a relationship with God. And that is missed in the, in the lives and the minds of most people because most people don't know what a relationship means. I prefer the word that the Bible gives. Let us have a conversation with God. Because the Bible says, uh, the song says, just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. And we need to have that conversation with God rather than learn about God, uh, talking about God, learning about people telling us about God. Let us learn to talk to God ourselves. And so Peter and John are in the temple to talk to God and to have conversation and communication with him. And the Bible says in verse 2 that while he was there, they saw a lame man who was lame from his mother's uh, birth, from the birth of the, uh, from his mother, and he was at the temple gate that was called Beautiful. And he was there collecting alms. Now I want you to understand something about this man. Number one, the Bible says he was lame from his birth, which means to say that he could not walk. And because he could not walk, it means that he could not work. And because he could not work, and because he could not walk, he could not worship. Because the Bible tells us that a man who was lame could not enter into the temple of God. A man who was afflicted with that condition was not allowed to worship in the temple of God. And so this lame man could not walk, and because he could not walk, he could not work, but because he could not walk and because he could not work, he could not worship. And here was a man, therefore, that was on, uh, on the outside. He was on the periphery of worship. He was on the periphery of the church. He was an outcast, as it were, sitting on the outside, expecting something from those people who are going into the church, hoping that as the people go into the church, something would happen to those people, and when they came out of the church, they would help him. You see, he was looking for people to be changed by church. He was looking to see that people who came to church 
had a transformation which would help them when they left and came outside the church, that they would help him. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that is still the need today, that when we come to church, when we come to meet with God, that there is a transformation, there is a change in the heart, there's a change in the life, so that instead of walking over people, you see, every day, people would walk over this layman. They would cross over him in order to come to worship. And when they were leaving church, they would walk over him or pass around him at the end of worship, but there was no transformation of character. There was no change in the life. They were not there to help him. And so this layman was an outcast. He was in the periphery of, of religion. He was in the periphery of worship. He was not allowed into church, and he was not getting help from church. And as this man was there, and he was at that lame uh, stage, lame state, waiting, he saw Peter and John passing by, and they were by the Gate Beautiful. Now, the Gate Beautiful was at the eastern gate of the temple. So there were several gates. This one was called the Gate Beautiful. The interesting thing about the Gate Beautiful is that the Gate Beautiful, when you looked into it from the Mount of Olives, you could see directly into the Temple of God. So that Eastern Gate was significant. Jesus himself was the one that passed through the Eastern Gate when he went into the Temple from the Mount of Olives. And so here was this man sitting at the Eastern Gate, the Gate Beautiful, but for him, it was not a beautiful gate. For him, it was a place of hopelessness. For him, it was a place of helplessness. For him, it was a place of despair because he was lame for birth. He could not walk, and therefore he could not work, and he could not worship. But he was sitting at the gate called Beautiful. And Peter and John are entering, going into the temple, passing by the eastern gate called Beautiful. And the scripture says, while they are going there, they see the man and he asks them, would you help a brother out? Here is this man who is lame from birth. He's a beggar and he's looking and saying to Peter and John, could you help a brother out? Could you give me some arms, some arms for the poor? Because he's a lame man, for he cannot walk. And because he cannot walk, he cannot work. And because he cannot work, he cannot enter into the temple of God to worship. And so he turns and asks Peter and John, if they will help him out, give him some arms, give him something so that he could continue to survive. He was being carried there, I was assumed, day by day by someone who would take him from his home and put him to sit outside the beautiful gate. The Bible says in verse 4, and Peter fastening his eyes upon him and John with John said, look on us, look on us. And I could imagine as I looked at the stories, brothers and sisters, that here is this man who is not only in despair, here is a man that is not only poor, here is a man that is not only a beggar, he is so distressed, he is so de de depressed, he, is, he, is, he is, has so much little self-worth, he doesn't even look up to see people as he's passing. He does not even raise his eyes up. He is a man as a beggar man, and, and, and he feels ashamed and embarrassed. So he keeps his eyes down as he puts out his little cup saying, arms for the poor, arms for the poor. And so Peter and John, seeing this man with his eyes down, begging arms for the poor, turns to the man and says, sir, look up, look upon us, look upon us. And so the Bible says that he gave heed unto them, and he raised his eyes and looked upon Peter and John arms for the poor. The Bible says, expecting to receive something from them. And as they came and this, uh, Peter said unto them in verse 6, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You see, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I come to the conclusion that silver and gold is not the answer to your problem. You see, Peter did not have silver and gold, but he recognized that what he had was more valuable than silver and gold. What this man needed was not money. That's what he asked for. But on the basis of every physical problem, there is a spiritual need. This man had a physical problem. He was lame from his birth. He could not walk, which means that he could not work. And because he could not work, he could not worship. But this man's problem was not a physical one. This man's major problem was not the need for money. It was not the need for financial help, though he needed it. 
You see, Peter and John recognized that this man had a bigger problem. This man's problem was a spiritual one. You know what I say today, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, there's lots of people who have money today, but many of us know that many of these people with money are miserable. There are lots of rich people that are killing themselves. And that is because they don't understand, they don't appreciate, and they have not received the spiritual need of their soul. Every man has a spiritual requirement, and that spiritual requirement is Jesus Christ. You see, today, ladies and gentlemen, you may not have money, you may not be a financial person, you may not have a, a degree, you may not be a doctor that you can help the person who is sick, a person who is unwell. You may not be able to provide them with transport or even give them food, but you can give them Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? You can give them something because such as you have, you give them. You see, Peter and John says, I have Jesus. I don't have money. I don't have gold. I don't have silver, but I have something more valuable than all of that. I have Jesus Christ. And you see, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, should have a such. Everybody should be walking around with a such as. So that wherever you meet somebody, you can always give them a such. And the, the, the Peter and John had a such to give them. He says, you know what? I don't have Peter, uh, silver and gold, but I have a such. The such I have is Jesus Christ. And so they said to the man, I give you Jesus Christ. I give you the answer to your spiritual need, Jesus Christ. And so in verse 6, the Bible says, they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they did the third part of the element. So we have said, number one, the hour of prayer is the first step of discipleship. Number two is we need to address those who are outcasts, those who are not included in church, those who have the tattoos, those who don't smell so good, maybe they don't dress so well, maybe they go to places you and I would not go. The outcast are the people who need to hear about Jesus. Would you say amen? And the third element we've picked up already is you must give them a such. You must give them a such as. And the such as that you give them is not always food. It may not be clothes. It may not be money. But you can give them Jesus Christ. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, they said, rise up and walk. And number four, the Bible says in verse seven, after they said that, they took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. You see, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, God wants us to reach out a hand, not to hand out, but sometimes we need to give people a hand up. This man needed a hand up. He didn't need a hand out. And so the Bible says that Peter reached a hand out and helped him up. And so this man got strength in his limbs. He got power in his limbs. And the Bible says his feet and his ankle bones received strength and he was able to walk. And in verse 8 says he was leaping and, 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 and praising God. He was leaping and, and walking and jumping and praising God. And as a result of the, the transformation and because this lame man who was lame from his birth, he could not walk. And because he could not walk, he could not work. And because he could not walk and he could not work, he could not worship. This lame man, having received Jesus Christ and the healing that comes as a result of the power of prayer and the power of the name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says he is now able to enter into the temple. He's able to worship God. The Bible says he enters into the temple, leaping and walking and praising God. And the verse, verse 9 says, And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And verse 10 says, And they knew that it is he which used to sit at the temple gate begging for alms. They saw that it was him that used to sit at the temple gate begging for alms. You see, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, when God touches your life, you are transformed. You used to be like that. You used to sit at the temple gate. You used to do what you used to do. You used to be the way you used to be. But when Jesus transforms your life, you are suddenly transformed and you are used to be, used to be. It no longer are you what you used to be. You are transformed by the mighty working and power of Jesus Christ. The Bible says they saw him leaping and walking and praising God and recognized that he used to be the one that was begging arms at the temple gate. And the Bible says he was there in the temple. And the, in verse, verse 10 says, And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. You see, when God touches our life, when Jesus transforms our life, people are amazed. 
They look at says, and I know this man, I know this woman, I know what they used to do. And this man is a different person. This person has been transformed and changed because he's not like what he used to be, because he has been touched by the master's hand. And so the Bible says they were amazed at that which had happened to him. And you know, when you go a little further down in the story, as we try to wind it up, the Bible says that when they started to see this man, they started to look at Peter and John as if they were special, as if they were some sort of gods. And Peter said unto them in verse 12, Why, ye men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why do you look upon us earnestly as though it is by our own power, our holiness, that we made this man to walk? You see, that's one of the big things that we look on the discipleship. Today, if somebody came and did a healing, you saw a miracle in a church, all of a sudden they want an offering. They want you to bring so much money and you get a cloth or you'll get, you'll get a bag of chips or something and they will send it to you because, you know, and they have a ministry. All of a sudden it's a healing ministry and the church because they want people to look at them and they want them to receive the blessing to them. But when you look at Peter's response and John's, Peter says, no, this is not me. This is not me. There's nothing that I have done here. He gave the praise to Jesus Christ. And so the fifth point we look on discipleship is that when you, are, when you are there ministering to people, whatever you do, whether you're a teacher or a, or a, or a preacher or, 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 or somebody conducting a, a business or, or doing your op shop, it doesn't matter what you do, the praise has to go to Jesus Christ. This is not something to look at you. It is a measure to look at Jesus Christ. And so he says, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, had glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered, denied him in the presence of Pilate when he determined to let him go. And in verse, th verse 16 it says, And it is in his name, through faith, in his name that had made this man strong, uh, whom you have seen and know, the faith which is by him hath given him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. He refers and points everybody to Jesus Christ. This is the mighty power of Jesus. This is nothing that we have done. This is the anointing of the Holy Spirit that is now demonstrated in discipleship that would lead people not only to Jesus Christ, but to a healing power and a healing experience in their lives. Let me close with three things, therefore, that we can learn from the story of Acts chapter 3. The story of Acts chapter 3. Number one, number one is we should slow down and pay attention to, to, to those who are outcast. We should slow down and pay attention to those who are in the periphery, those who don't come to church, those who don't attend or fellowship. We should slow down and take time to, to minister to them, time to minister and to see them. You know, that could be sometimes getting somebody who is always being a waiter or waitress or maybe at a restaurant when they come to serve you and they give you food. Maybe we could be saying things like, thank you and God bless you. Is there anything I could pray for you for? Now, that might sound strange, but that's what, that's what the word declares. Bless you. Thank you so very much for what you have done. Is there anything I can do or pray for you? We need to slow down and reach out to those who are in the, in the periphery, those who are not among us, those who are not in church, and, and, and offer them an opportunity to meet Jesus Christ. That's number one. Number two, that we need to stand at the gate beautiful again. You see, many of our lives are not beautiful. What made that gate beautiful was not its presence in the temple. As a matter of fact, the gate was not beautiful. What made that gate beautiful was the presence of Jesus Christ. Jesus came into that place and transformed the life and the gate beautiful became a beautiful gate. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, our lives are meant to be the temple of the Holy Ghost. Our lives need to be the gate beautiful. Our lives need to be transformed. And the only way our lives will be the beautiful gate is if the presence of Jesus Christ is in our lives. Would you say amen? God wants Jesus to come into our lives that we can be the gate beautiful. So that as people come in contact with them, come, come in contact with us, and we come in contact with them, we can introduce them to Jesus Christ. And we can offer them the help up, the hand out that will allow them to find their salvation. Not the physical answer, not the, not the financial answer, but the spiritual answer. And the third thing I say to you is that we can all rise up. Whatever your problem is, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, whatever your situation, whatever your circumstance is, we can all get up. We can all rise up. We can all go, uh, uh, move forward and move up. But the way we have to do it is to look up. You see, this man received healing because he looked up. And if you want to receive your healing this morning, 
If you want to have your deliverance this morning, if you want to have a victory in your life this morning, I encourage everybody to look up. Look up and see Jesus Christ. Look up and see the Savior. Look up and see the power of God that is available to you. And when we pray, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we depend on him and make our gate, the beautiful gate by his presence. And when we look up and reach up to him, because the Bible says he stretches forth the hand, then we too can rise up. And we can rise up and help somebody to find Jesus. Would you say amen? Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning. The gate beautiful is a beautiful gate. A beautiful gate where Jesus met with that man, that lame man. He, could, he was lame from birth. He could not walk, and because of that, he could not work. And because he could not work, he could not worship. But you've, you've met him at the gate beautiful and made it a beautiful gate. Because he, was, he reached out and, and met Jesus. He received the power and the authority of Jesus, and he rose up and walked. Today, oh God, we want to be the gate beautiful to gain. We want to be that beautiful gate that the feet of those who come near to us will receive the anointing presence of your spirit, that we can lift up, uh, raise up a hand to them and lift them up into the beautiful uh, feet and trod the path of Jesus Christ. But today we look up. We look up to you. The Bible says, look upon the Lord, look up and live. We look upon thee. And we ask you now to transform these hearts, these, these lives, these earthen vessels, so that the word we speak and the life we live will bring honor and glory to you, just like Peter, James, and John, that they can take note that we have been with Jesus. We thank you for this word this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen.